Since the last episode of the Hunky Vape Global 20, some YouTube reviewers issued strikes are now jumping ship like Jay Hayes and Rip Trippers did last year. The FDA admits that they're doing the best that they can at failing public health. And the e-cigarette summit, public health whitewashers, met their maker during the Mark Sills and Clive Bates presentation. Ain't nothing to it, but to get into it. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy and News for the week ending May 21st, 2022. Unbelievable. Already in May. Michelle Mittal has become the acting director of the FDA CTP. But this is a short-lived interim position, as yesterday, Dr. Robert M. Califf took on the proverbial Friday federal trash by announcing on Twitter that he has selected Dr. Brian A. King as the FDA's new Center for Tobacco Products director. This should come as absolutely no surprise to anyone, as Dr. King was the primary investigator on the CDC's response team during the Volley Panic campaign. Dude, you can't say that. You can't call the Volley outbreak a CDC panic campaign. Everybody's going to think you're your conspiracy nut job. Okay, okay, okay. Here's the facts, and I'll let you be the judge, jury, and executioner. On October 3rd, 2019, the CDC held a press briefing, and Dr. Brian King from the CDC's response team was to join and answer any additional questions. The press briefing started out with Dr. Ann Shuchat, the principal deputy director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, warning the press. Unfortunately, the outbreak of pulmonary injury associated with e-cigarette use or vaping is continuing at a brisk pace. CDC is continuing our investigation. Blah, 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 blah. And unfortunately, we've now surpassed 1,000 lung injury cases in this outbreak. Consistent with the case definition, all reported patients have a history of using e-cigarettes or vaping products. Who came up with this case definition? E-cigarette vaping associated lung injuries. Hmm. Could it possibly have been Dr. Brian King himself? As we have continued to get data for additional cases, the trends we reported last week persist. Most patients report a history of using THC-containing products, and most patients are male and young people. Most patients report a history of using THC-containing products. Hmm. By 2019, $75 billion worth of vapor products have been sold, and in 2019, they were slated to sell another $20 billion worth of vaping products, to total almost a trillion dollars worth of tobacco harm reduction. By 2019, there were an estimated 64 billion vapors around the globe, and at least 44.4 billion vapors for sure in countries that had documented surveys. In 2019, over 60 billion people used electronic cigarettes every single day to not smoke. You think the CDC didn't know how ridiculous they sounded to 60 plus billion people who use nicotine vaping products daily, some of them for almost a decade? Yet they chose to call this outbreak of isolated deaths a volley. From the very first patient death, they knew that it was contaminated THC products yet they painted all electronic cigarettes and vaping products under the same brushstroke. Now listen to the language that they used in this press briefing. We've continued to assess what products patients have used, and we now have information for 578 patients with information on substances used in e-cigarette or vaping products in the three months 
before symptom onset. We found that about 78% reported using THC-containing products and 37% reported using only THC-containing products. About 58% reported using nicotine-containing products and 17% reported using only nicotine-containing products. Now, do you think that the CDC doesn't know that everybody lies? So you think I'm exaggerating about everybody lies? Well, here, go watch this video on YouTube, Everybody Lies, by Seth Stevens Davidowitz, RSA Replay. This guy wrote a book called Everybody Lies, Big Data, New Data, and What the Internet Can Tell Us About Who We Really Are. I'd go tell you to read the book, but I know most people, they don't read anymore. They just go watch videos on YouTube to find the answers that they want. And speaking of books, not on YouTube, have you read Stop Smoking, Start Vaping? This book breaks the whole process down into three easy to digest sections. Number one, it starts off with the evidence on vaping and nicotine. Number two, well, obviously, start vaping. And number three, controversies and solutions. You know, from myth busting to doing your homework, this book dispels the myths and even addresses the human right to optimal health. And this is the reason today's Global 20 is focusing on dispelling a volley myth and calling out the lack of responsibility from CDC, FDA, and even Dr. Brian King. Regardless, my point is, how many users of THC suffered unnecessary lung injuries? All because the CDC and the FDA did not warn cannabis users that there might be tainted THC carts in the supply chain. Or if they didn't know exactly what was causing all these lung injuries, why didn't they emphasize the data that clearly showed 78% admitted THC usage. Oh, wait. The CDC press briefing did say that. Given the continued occurrence of life-threatening new cases, CDC recommends that people refrain from using e-cigarette or vaping products, particularly those containing THC. Regardless of this investigation, e-cigarettes should not be used by youth, young adults, pregnant women, or people who've not previously used tobacco products. Once again, the CDC did highlight, particularly those containing THC, but they buried it in the middle of the paragraph. It's like all federal public health messages. They tell the truth, but unless you're looking for the truth and you spend time to analyze exactly what they said, a key piece of public health information is completely lost in their messaging. And I say this is totally unacceptable. From the press briefing we're talking about until today, an additional 1,727 people got lung injuries from using black market contaminated THC carts. Surely most of them could have avoided their life altering and debilitating lung injuries. If only the message CDC and FDA sent was clear and concise, they should have said, at this time, it appears the THC supply chain contains an oil substance injuring lungs and causing lipoid pneumonia. Please be aware, your next THC cart may kill you if it is contaminated, period. Now, instead, they chose this as an opportunity to push their unattainable use prevention agenda. No youth use. No young adult use. No pregnant use. Hey, that brings me to this week's science segment published in Nature News. Electronic cigarettes versus nicotine patches for smoking cessation in pregnancy. A randomized controlled trial. 1,140 participants compared refillable e-cigarettes with nicotine patches. Pregnant women who smoked were randomized into 
e-cigarette, number 569, or nicotine patches, number 571. And to follow my own advice, I'm going to skip the scientific jargon and simply report vaping was twice as effective to stop smoking compared to using nicotine patches. In addition, e-cigarette users had 35% less low birth weight for their babies than NRT users did. Did you get that? Safety for both nicotine patches and electronic cigarettes were the exact same. Except that if a pregnant woman used a vape instead of patches to quit smoking, well, their babies were more likely to have a normal birth weight. So, summing it up, vaping is twice as effective to stop smoking and improve the birth weight of pregnant women who stop smoking during their pregnancy. Now that's the message that we should be seeing in the newspapers and social media right now. Simple, accurate, and the message is going to improve public health. And speaking of public health advocacy, I need to tell you about Clive Bates' presentation at the E-Cigarette Summit 2022. Now, I could have easily picked Mark Sliss and his heartfelt moving presentation, policy and regulatory impact on the vape shop, or how he pointed out that smokers are treated as acceptable collateral damage in the war against big tobacco because of these regulations. Or I could have talked about how the FDA and tobacco control trains the public to despise us ex-smokers but it's nowhere near as scathing as Clive Bates talking about why FDA regulation is an almighty mess. His goal was to focus on 10 provocations in 15 minutes. And folks, let me tell you, when a speaker starts out their presentation with um, no criticism of anyone present or absent, living or dead, is implied or expressed in this presentation. It means that the room is going to be on fire at the conclusion of the presentation. So before I continue, I highly recommend that you go and watch his presentation. Just click on the link in the description below to go watch Clive Bates. And while you're down there, hit the like and subscribe button for more public health videos like this one. Now... If you don't have time for his rushed presentation, no problem. No worries. I got you covered. Here's the Cliff Notes version of what he did. Number one, FDA reality of anti-proportionate regulation. Subsection A, regulation in theory, enjoy, and big tobacco. No problem, buddy. Let me work with you. Regulation in reality. Are you a cigarette product? No problem. 3,000 cigarettes are on the market, largely unmolested by FDA. Are you a small company with modest turnover? Forget it. If you're not big enough, you can't play. Do you have a non-tobacco flavor? Non-tobacco flavor. No chance. Can you handle excessive burdens, complexity, opaque standards, and completely stopping your innovation? And crushing any prospects for innovation. The truly terrible review process. Number two. Terrible risk perceptions. Only 2.6% of Americans rightly think vaping is much less harmful than smoking. 62% wrongly think vaping is as harmful or more harmful than smoking. And lastly, 24% of the population are completely confused and have no idea what to think about the subject. What's worse is that this whole thing has gotten more wrong since 2014. 72% are so very wrong and don't know that smokeless tobacco is less harmful than smoking. 56% wrongly think nicotine is the primary cause of cancer. So naturally he asks, is the FDA to blame? Yes, it is. It is to blame. Here's why. Weird campaigns. Wasted budget. $180 million FDA spent on communications. Then it spent that whole amount misleading young people and adults. Telling them that nicotine is brain poison. What does that mean? What, is it, what are you actually communicating to the public with that? 
Number four, distorted research agenda. 43% of Center for Tobacco Products budget goes into science. Creates weird conflicts of interest. Why? What's their agenda? For NIH researchers to find problems for regulators to address. The agenda is clearly found in the Tobacco Control Research Branch mission. In order to create a world free of tobacco and related cancer and suffering. So what's the problem with this? It doesn't start with the cancer and suffering and ask an open question about how we address that. It starts with an end point. Now, if you guys are about to tune out, let me assure you, the next section is worth sticking around because misunderstanding youth is something that Clive Bates is very passionate about and even warned the audience. Um, I feel very strongly about this, so stand by. Um, Number five, misunderstanding youth. Profile of vaping epidemic is all wrong. Gigantic moral panic. Looking at the data, it peaked in 2019. And ever since then, we've been living in a moral panic. So how about we take the 2019 peak figure and break that down to find out the truth that frequent use by non-smokers is only 1.4%. Frequent use by teens is actually diverting kids away from smoking. 85% of frequent vapors are prior tobacco users. And the FDA attitude of no child left behind? Huh. That's more like no child should use tobacco. Even if the kids are using ends instead of cigarettes, that is still not an acceptable trade-off for the FDA. And the reason they do that is because they focus on poster child kids like this instead of the at-risk kids. Kids that live tough lives. Kids who are almost predisposed to becoming smokers. These are the kids that we should be worrying about. Not these poster child kids. Number six, flavors. Why on earth does the FDA pick tobacco flavor as the only flavor that's going to be permissible for adult smokers to try and quit smoking with. I mean, with that kind of mentality, you might as well have picked rancid meat flavors, the only flavor that's going to be allowed on the market. Nobody's going to use it. Problem solved. Absolutely no use use of tobacco products if it's a rancid meat flavor. What? That they're not going to do that? That's not acceptable? How about the kids are not attracted because of the flavors in these products. But it is what keeps the adults from going back to smoking. How about some lessons from the past? Like the use of flavors. That they keep touting 81.5% of kids picked the vaping product because of their flavor. How about the fact that they answered a bunch of questions as the reason why they did that? Look at all these other reasons that they have here. I don't understand why the FDA is stuck on the like to use flavors is the only reason why youth use these new emerging tobacco products. Maybe we should look at the science and see what else is given as part of the reasons as to why these kids are using these products. And that removing flavors does absolutely nothing to all of these other reasons. Why don't we go and actually step back and take a look at what are the predictors of smoking onset for the youth in today's generation? Why don't we think about the fact that there are deeper things going on inside of their heads? What is going on inside of the psyche of these kids? That is what should be the focus, not what device that they're using. The device is completely irrelevant. Do you think that kids are going to stop vaping if flavors are completely banned? Do you really think that they're just going to go on and do more piano practice and do more homework and completely forget about everything? Why don't you ask the kids and adults? Because if you did, you'd find out that they're just going to go back to smoking cigarettes. 
which leads us to number seven, confusion about nicotine. And why on earth the FDA is approving very low nicotine cigarettes? If a vape with low nicotine and had all the harms of combustion were submitted to the FDA, the FDA would say, no way. Are you crazy? Why is the FDA problematizing nicotine? That is a bad move. We've already talked about how everybody thinks that nicotine is the primary cause of cancer. If you want to eliminate cancer, you need to focus on what's actually causing the cancer. And it's not the nicotine. Creating a rule around this is completely preposterous. And all they're actually going to do with all these bans and all of the regulatory actions is create a thriving black market. Which leads us to number eight. Vaping needs to be looked at as an innovation. It is the natural evolution away from combustion. Just like the transition from combustion to renewable products, like electronic vehicles for car companies, or like wind farms for oil companies. If you want to know who actually is doing it right, you're going to have to take a look at Shenzhen, China, because they have a consumer focus to meet the consumers where they are and meet consumer demand and keep innovation at the forefront of technology. Meanwhile, the U.S. FDA maintains strictly regulatory compliance focus only. The consumer is nowhere in the equation. The only thing the FDA cares about is regulatory compliance, anti-innovation, environment, and products that are stuck in the previous decade. Then Clive moves on to number nine. Poor value for the money. And Clive even admits that this is a cheap shot. What has the public gotten from the $7 billion in user fees collected by the FDA? And he goes right to Mitch Zeller's perspective when he was retiring and giving his, giving his farewell speech. What did they do? What did Mitch Zeller do this whole time? Oh, we expanded the size of the office a little bit, did some compliance work, you know, some good communication. But he did absolutely nothing at the public health benefit. And he got the model wrong for smoking cessation. And hence we leave with number 10. The model is completely wrong at the FDA for smoking cessation because these are not smoking cessation therapy products. These are an alternative consumer product for smokers who want to improve their health outcomes but not give up what gives them satisfaction. Then he finishes off with, you know, Hey, FDA, this is what you look like to vape shops. Because right now, the FDA is literally just clawing to get rid of all of these vape shops across the country. And then Clive Bates finishes off the presentation by saying, what does the FDA have to say to all the real human vapors that are simply just trying to improve their lives? Do they matter less? than some 16-year-old playing with a vape. So he leaves it there. I told you guys, you need to go watch his presentation. It's way better than anything that I can do. However, this brings us back to Brian A. King, PhD, MPH. Now let me draw your attention to a CDC Grand Rounds presentation from November 17th of 2015, where this deputy director, research translation, office on smoking and health, gave a very comprehensive overlay of e-cigarettes from that time period. And I find it completely fascinating, even back then, that they were concerned about, really concerned about, dual use and nicotine harming the developing adolescent brain. Oh my goodness, 
three times as many as 2011, he goes out and touts about. Here we are a decade later. How many of these adolescents are now adults? How many of them smoke? How many of them still vape? Where's the data to show these figures? I think these are all valid questions. And if the answer to them was as they predicted back then, I could understand the regulatory framework that we see before us today. But guess what? Clive Bates showed the present data. Well, at least the data from 2021, less adolescents vape and less adolescents have tried vaping than they did in 2015 when he gave that presentation. Where's all the health consequences that they were talking about that were inevitable? Or has there only been public health gains for all those smokers who quit smoking because of vaping? I mean, I want to know the answers to the, all these questions, don't you? Brian A. King has been on the forefront of vaping research at the CDC since it first landed in the United States. And in 2015, they raised questions about the numerous flavorings used in electronic cigarettes. They said that these flavorings are all generally recognized as safe for ingestion, but not for inhalation. So how much research has been done to determine if these flavorings are safe for inhalation? Has the CDC or the FDA spent any resources whatsoever to find out if flavorings are safe for inhalation? Clive Bates clearly demonstrated how the FDA has collected and spent $7 billion in tobacco user fees since 2009. Why don't they have an answer to any of these questions? Surely at some point in the last decade, they asked at least one researcher to find out if it's safe to inhale vanilla flavoring or strawberry or root beer flavoring. I haven't been able to find any answers to any of these questions in the scientific studies paid for by the FDA. The only thing that keeps popping up is something that they already knew about back then. The diacetyl causes popcorn lung. But they leave out the fact that it only caused popcorn lung in popcorn lung factory workers, not in vapors. Show me one person who has suffered popcorn lung because they were vaping. There are an estimated 81 million vapors in the world today. That's 81 million people using these products every single day instead of lighting a cigarette on fire. So where's this massive influx and increase in vapors getting sick that they said was going to happen? Or are all these vapors simply improving their health outcomes because they no longer smoke? Even back in 2015, the CDC knew for adults who smoke, switching to vaping is less harmful than smoking. For anyone else, e-cigarette use could be harmful to their health. So they shouldn't start. And we're going to do everything we can to stop it. It's so challenging to simultaneously implement public health policy that addresses both of these needs equally. When are they going to start addressing these needs equally? They just keep saying, we need more money. We need adequate funding for health promotion, education, policies, and environmental changes. Hey, isn't that exactly what Dr. Califf went to the Hill for just this past week? Didn't he just call for additional funding to the FDA? How about the FDA already squandered over $7 billion in user fees? And they just keep asking for more money. You know... Mark Sliss was right. They will never reach smokers like his vape shop reaches smokers and get people to actually stop smoking. And isn't that the goal here to improve public health by getting people to stop smoking? Is Brian A. King going to focus on the public health challenge 
of an eliminating combustion? Or is he only going to keep the status quo? In 2015, at this Public Health Grand Rounds presentation, he said, Well, in the 2014 Surgeon General's report, it was very clear that the overwhelming burden of death and disease from tobacco use is combustible products, such as cigarettes and and, uh, other combustibles. And so we don't want to lose sight of the prize. And we know that in terms of public health burden, um, combustibles are are public enemy number one. But it's important to remember e-cigarettes in that context and how that can influence patterns of combustible use moving forward. And so irrespective of where a state may may be on the the continuum, um, we still need to remember that e-cigarettes are not... Um, the, the, the primary focus in combustibles are the, the public health burden, but we can't lose sight of these emerging products, including e-cigarettes and anything else that might come on the market and how that can impact our efforts to address combustible use using the proven interventions that we know work. Before you get your hopes up, he also gave an interview to WDSU when they were doing one of their undercover investigations. And during this interview, he said, the advertising will lead a horse to water. The flavors will get them to drink. And the nicotine keeps them coming back for more. That's the trifecta of factors that have influenced youth use in this country. Flavors are among the primary reason that youth report using these products. And that most youth e-cigarette users first start with a flavored variety. You know, folks, I think deep down we already know the role that he's going to play. So leave a comment below. And let me know what you think he's going to be doing. I'll give you my answer in the next episode. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending May 21st, 2021. Don't forget to hit the like button and leave a comment below and let me know what you guys are thinking. I'm still waiting for a couple of things to come in, like the new microphone arm to replace this monstrosity you see right here. As you can see, I've already got all the flavorings organized behind me. And once everything is completely finished in here, I'm going to announce the start of weekly live shows, like Mixing and Chilling with Hunky Vape, as well as the Daily Drag podcast to bring you the news, science, and advocacy a lot more often and in easier to digest chunks. So until then, have a fantastic day. Be good to each other. And my wish is always peace, love, and a hunky vape to eliminate smoking. Have a great day. Since the last episode of the Hunky Vape Global 20, some YouTube reviewers issued strikes are now jumping ship like Jay Hayes and Rip Trippers did last year. The FDA admits that they're going. They're going? Where are they going? I wish they'd go somewhere. Cut.